Your grace is enough, Lord. Your grace is enough. We experience the grace of our Lord and Savior every day as he forgives those sins that we confess to him. We offer him praise this morning for who he is and for what he does within our hearts and lives and all around us in this beautiful world that he has created. Let's sing about that. This is my father's world and I sing the mighty power of God. Let's stand together as we sing. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me. everybody. Y'all can be seated for just a second. I wanted to uh, tell y'all a short story real quick. It involves a couple fellas uh, named Boudreaux and Thibodeau. Anybody familiar with them? Okay. So uh, one day Boudreaux and Thibodeau, they, they, they wanted to go into town and they were going to go window shopping. And so they're walking on the sidewalk and they come across this store. It's got a big old window and in the sign, I mean in the window, there's a sign that reads, Suits, $10 each. Shirts, $5 each. Pants, $3 each. Ooh, they looked at each other. Boudreaux said to Thibodeau, man, Thibodeau, man, the fella could buy a lot of fancy clothes for that amount of money. Thibodeau says, yeah, but we go in there, we, we, we go in there talking like this. They, they, they gonna think we ignorant and they may try to raise the price on us. So Boudreaux says, all right, I got a plan. He says, we're going to go in there and I'm going I'm to talk in the fanciest accent I know. And we're we going to get us a bunch of them fancy clothes for, for cheap. So they go walking in and they walk up to the counter and the man standing behind the counter, Boudreaux walks up and he says, excuse me, sir, I would like to purchase 50 
of your suits for $10. And he says, I would like to purchase 60 of your shirts for $5. And he says, I would like to purchase 100 of your pants for $3. The man behind the counter, he looks at him, looks at Boudreaux, looks at Thibodeau. And he says, you boys are from the swamp, ain't you? And all surprised, Boudreaux's like, well, 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 yeah, but, but, but how did you know? He says, because son, this is a dry cleaner. <laughs> That's ignorant, ain't it? They, they, they was definitely ignorant. Y'all, this morning we're talking about ignorance. We're going to be talking about ignorance. And we're going to talk about how to combat ignorance. And we're going to look at ignorance in, in certain groups of people. People who are ignorant in who God is. We're going to look at people who are ignorant in what scripture says and means. And we're going to look at people who are ignorant in what God wants them to do in their life. And we're going to talk about how to combat the ignorance that's all around us and how to witness to those who are stuck in their ignorance. I want to welcome everybody this morning to Union Baptist Church. If you're, if you're visiting here, we have some cards in the pew in front of you. If you don't mind filling those out, uh, help us get to know you a little bit, get a little information. Uh, and whenever you go to leave this morning, there's going to be some handsome gentlemen in the back that will take those cards and will turn those cards in. Uh, but I also, I have a couple announcements. Uh, the personnel committee, you're going to be meeting right after church up here uh, by the stage. I also have a couple announcements for those who have students going to camp and for the students who are going to camp. Uh, on Saturday, July 1st, that's this coming Saturday, we're going to meet at 8 a.m., okay? How many of y'all are up at 8 a.m.? <laughs> Just the adults in the third row. So... <laughs> We're going to meet at 8 a.m. That is a real time uh, to clean up the buses. Okay, so if you have a student going to camp, wake them up, get them here at 8 a.m. We're going to clean up the two buses that were taken. Uh, and then on Sunday, we're going to have a luggage, luggage, luggage load up time between 5 and 7. I'm going to be here between 5 and 7 p.m. Uh, bring your luggage to the church. We're going to load them up in the buses so we're not having to deal with all that uh, Monday morning when we leave bringing us to Monday morning, we're going to be leaving at 8 a.m. Oh, y'all just can't escape that 8 a.m., can you? We're going to be leaving at 8 a.m. on July 3rd uh, to go to camp, but arrive here between 7 and 7.30. We're going to have some breakfast. We're going to have a time of prayer before we leave. Uh, and if you don't, if you aren't able to bring your luggage on Sunday, bring it uh, between 7 and 7.30 when you arrive, and we'll load it up then. Uh, so uh, again, welcome everybody. We're going to pray, and we're going to get back into worship. So God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for each and every person that you've brought here uh, to worship and brought here to hear your word this morning. God, I pray that as, as I'm speaking your word, that it would be you speaking through me. God, I pray for power from your Holy Spirit. I pray for authority from your Holy Spirit, God. And Lord, I just pray that it would not fall on, on any deaf ears, God. I pray that there's, there's even just one person who gets something out of the message this morning. God, it's worth it. And we thank you for that. Lord, we just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will also be praying for uh, our pastor and his wife as they are enjoying some time of vacation up in Kentucky. Uh, if you've been on Facebook, you've seen some of the pictures that they've been uh, posting there from their time away. We pray that they will have safety and they will uh, receive some much needed rest as well. Each of us has a need in our hearts and lives and the Lord wants to meet all of those needs that we have. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace 
grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me yes where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. submission all is at rest i in my savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story Let's stand together as we sing the first, second, and last stanzas. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest grain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock that said, all other ground is all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, I anchor hold. 
Sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes. 
Well, good morning again. I feel like I just saw y'all. If you want to turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 17, that's where we're going to be this morning. And we'll get there in just a moment. <clears throat> so like I said, uh, this morning we're talking about combating ignorance. Combating ignorance. Now, ignorance is the lack of knowledge about a subject caused by the circumstances of one's life. So if you break that definition down a little bit, we have the obvious lack of knowledge. That's what we think of when we think of ignorance, a lack of knowledge. This could be though, a lack of understanding. It could be a lack of knowing what to do, what to say, how to act, how to feel, or even a lack of giving due respect to something that is due your respect. And so there's all different kinds of ignorance. I'll give you an example of ignorance, of, of my ignorance, when I was a kid. Uh, so when I was uh, uh, probably about 13, 12 or 13 years old, my family, we didn't grow up, we, we grew up camping, but it was in tents, right? And so we never had an RV, we never had a camper. I had no experience with the camper. I was ignorant when it come to anything to do with a camper. And so I went uh, with my sister's boyfriend's family, now my brother-in-law and his family. Uh, and so we went up to Pickwick Lake. Anybody ever been to Pickwick Lake? It's, it's up in North Mississippi, in the northeast corner of Mississippi. It actually uh, is right where Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee meet. And so it's literally right there in that corner. And so we were up there. We spent about 15 days there. When we got done, we were putting everything up. We were packing up everything and we had to pack up the camper. Well, if you've ever, ever, ever had an experience with a camper, it was one of those with the pullout awning. And so whenever you, you have to unroll the awning and there's the string that's attached to the end of it that you have to hold or it's gonna, you know, flap up. I had never seen one of these before. I had no experience with this. And so I, ha I happened to be standing there and my brother-in-law, he's about to put up this awning. And he says, hey, Kyle, hold this. As you know, you're supposed to hold the string and whenever you click the little button, you keep it from you know, going up and you let it roll up real slow. And so when he told me, hold this, I had no idea what was about to happen. I put it in my hand and you know what went through my mind? You know what I thought he meant? This was where my ignorance came in. You know what I thought he meant? When he handed me that rope, that rope sure looked pretty. It looked like a brand new rope. And we were sitting over dirt. And in my mind, I was like, well, he doesn't want this rope to get dirty. And so I'm just holding it off the ground to keep dirt from getting on the rope. He clicks that button, that thing jerks out of my hand. <laughs> Boom, and it hits on the side of the camper. And I saw a side of my brother-in-law that I had never seen before. It scared me. I thought that was it for me. Because of my ignorance, that thing liked to broke. Luckily it didn't break, I don't think. I had an astounding lack of knowledge about what I was doing. Everybody has some kind of ignorance in their life. Everybody is ignorant about something. For example, I'm, I'm sorry, not yet. Some things it's okay to be ignorant about. And some things it's not. There are some things that's important to not be ignorant about, but other things it's okay. And it depends on the circumstances of your life for the things that it is okay to be ignorant about. For example, I'm ignorant in the field of surgery, in the surgical field. I don't know how to perform any kind of surgery whatsoever. Now, does anybody have an issue with that? Would anybody like for me to try to perform some kind of surgery? I didn't think so. Brother Anthony's ignoring me. I think he's, okay. Uh, I thought maybe he was Googling one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I'm ignorant in that field. And that's okay. The circumstances of my life did not take me into the medical field. Therefore, I'm ignorant in it. But imagine if I was going to take you fishing. Okay. I like to fish. If you don't know me, I like to fish. Let's say that I'm about to take you fishing. Brother Johnny, let's say me and you's gonna go fishing. All right, we're gonna go out. I'm gonna take you onto the Jordan River in my boat. We're gonna go run trot lines. Would it be okay with you if I was ignorant and how to operate my boat? <laughs> if, I didn't, if I didn't know the, the stern from the aft, huh? If I, if I didn't know where the motor was, if I didn't know how to operate the motor, 
If I, if I was ignorant in what to do if the motor were to shut off, that wouldn't be okay, right? If I own a boat and I'm going to take you out in my boat, I better not be ignorant in how to operate my boat, correct? That is something in life that is not okay for me to be ignorant about because of the circumstances. There are certain things in life that it's important not to be ignorant in. And the number one thing above all else that it is not okay to be ignorant in is the teachings of the Bible. That is the most important thing to not be ignorant in. And yet so many people are ignorant in the teachings of the Bible. The passage that we're looking at this morning in Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul addresses uh, certain groups of people in this passage. He, ad he addresses three different groups of people. And we're gonna, these are my three points. I'm gonna put all three points on the, on the screen this morning and I'm gonna leave them there. My three points and the three people that Paul addresses in this passage, number one, non-believers. He addresses people who do not believe in God. The second one is false believers. People who pretend to believe in God or have a false concept of who God is. The third one is baby believers or baby Christians. People who are recently saved or have been saved for however long but have not grown in their faith. They have never matured in their faith, therefore they are still baby believers or baby Christians. So if you look at me in Acts chapter 17, we're going to start reading in verse 16. And what that says is, it says, while Paul was waiting for them, talking about Silas and Timothy, he was waiting for them in Athens. So he's in the city of Athens. He was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. And so he's here in the city of Athens. He's looking around and he sees idols everywhere. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God as well as in the marketplace every morning with those who happened to be there. And those people who happened to be there were, verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who debated him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Other versions call him a, a ignorant babbler, somebody who babbles, somebody who makes no sense. Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of other foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So let's look at this passage real quick, this, this, this piece of the passage that we're reading. There are three people that Paul directly addresses in here. The first one, we're going to look at the Jews. And if you want to underline that or circle it, he, he addresses the Jews. It says he reasoned with the Jews. The Jews would be the false believers that we're talking about. Because they had a false concept of who God was. They, don't, they didn't believe, and still don't if, if they still are in the Jewish faith. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They don't believe in salvation through Jesus' sacrifice. They still believe that you have to live out by the, uh, you have to live your life by the Old Testament law. And so they had a false concept of who God is. See, Jesus at this time when Paul's writing, or technically Luke's writing about Paul, but whenever Paul is, you know, preaching this, whenever he's talking to these people, Jesus has already come and, and died and paid for our sins. And so now they're not living by the Old Testament anymore, but by Jesus' sacrifice. And the Jewish people do not believe that. And so they are religious, but they have a false concept of God. Another set of people that he talks to, it says he also reasoned with those who worshiped God. And so we have God worshipers here, but as far as we can tell, they're still falling into the idolatry that's plaguing the city of Athens because he's still having to reason with them. He's still having to, to talk to them. These would be the baby believers that we're talking about this morning because they have not matured enough to get out of, let alone speak out about the idol worship. And so here we have the baby believers. They believe in God and are probably even saved, but they haven't progressed in their faith since salvation. A lot of people think salvation, that's the end goal. No, the salvation is the beginning of a new life that you're walking and you have to mature in that new life. 
You start that at salvation, you start your new life as a baby believer, everybody does. But then you grow, you're supposed to grow in your faith. If you don't, you stay a baby believer. The other group of people that he talks to, it says that he debated with the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. If you're curious about who those people are, basically the Epicureans believed in self-pleasure above all else. They put themselves, their, their own pleasure, their own wants, their own you know, needs or whatever above everything else in life. The Stoic philosophers, they basically believed, you know what, whatever happens, happens. There's nothing we can do about it. Basically, they just believed in, in fate and whatever happens, happens. Are either of these Christian beliefs? No, they're not. And so here we have the non-believers. The three groups of people that we're talking about this morning, the non-believers, false believers, and baby believers, Paul has now set up, he is speaking to them and he sets up what he's about to do through these people. Let's continue reading in Acts chapter 17 starting in verse 19. So now he has met with all these three different kinds of people. And it says in verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching that you're presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us and we wanna know what these things mean. Now listen to this verse here, verse 21. Now all the Athenians, meaning everybody in the city, and even the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but hearing and telling something new. All they cared about were new things. All they wanted to see were new things. They didn't care about the old stuff. They didn't want to hear something twice. They wanted new, 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 new. And so they bring, I'm sorry, yeah, they bring Paul to the Areopagus, which Areopagus translated means hill of Ares. Ares being the Greek god of war. And you may see it called in, in your Bible, Mars Hill, which is uh, synonymously referring to the Roman god of war, Mars. And so even the names are of idols, Ares and Mars. And the Areopagus was the place where the Athenian court met. They had this council and they would meet and they would, they would have uh, these meetings and these trials and, and all kinds of stuff here with this, the uh, Areopagus court. It was the highest court in the land. And so they brought Paul here to let everyone hear what they had just called his ignorant babble. Verse 21 tells us that everybody in Athens wanted to hear it because they liked new things. They were all about the newest trends. If they were alive today, they'd have the newest iPhone every time it came out. They'd be spending the, whatever it is now, what is it, $800 for a brand new iPhone? They'd be spending that because they want something new. Every time something new comes out, they wanted it. They wanted to hear about it. They wanted to tell about it. <clears throat> because everybody liked new things and Paul had a new message to preach to them, we can assume that he has drawn a crowd. He's been going around the city, talking to all these different kinds of people, they hear this new message, they wanna know more about it, and so we can assume that he has drawn a crowd to the Areopagus. People have gathered at the Areopagus to hear what he has to say. Then Paul addresses them. He's not just talking to the council, the court. He's not just talking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. In verse 22, he starts off by saying, people of Athens, he's talking to everybody. He is, he is referring to everyone in what he's about to say. He's talking to the different kinds of people that he had met earlier. The non-believers, the false believers, and the baby believers. And here's what I want you to take out of this today. From what we're about to read, listen to the way Paul addresses them. I believe that Paul sets up the guidelines of how to witness to all three kinds of people. And in so doing, combating the ignorance and all three kinds of people, combating the ignorance of the non-believers, the false believers, and the baby believers. Let's read this in verse 22. It says, Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus, and I want you to underline a couple things here. He stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, there it is, referring to everybody, I see that you are extremely religious in every aspect. Underline that. I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar that was inscribed to the unknown God. 
Therefore, underline this verse right here. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Underline that. What you worship in ignorance. Verse 24, then God, I'm sorry, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in shrines made by hands. That's the last thing I want you to underline. Those three verses, you're underlining verse 22, 23, and 24, and make them separate somehow. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breathes all things. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him though we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are sprung then and shouldn't think that the divine nature is like God or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. So here we have his message. Here we have the thing that Paul wanted to convey to the people of Athens and the way that I believe that he sets up the proper way to witness to all these different kinds of people. Looking at the verses that you underlined, verse 22, when he says, um, I see that you are extremely religious in every aspect, he was showing them respect. He was forming a relationship. He's showing them love which is the first way that I believe Paul sets up to witness, is to love. The next way, he rebukes their sins and wrongdoings when he says, what you have worshiped in ignorance. See, they had called him ignorant to begin with, an ignorant babbler. Now he is saying, no, you are the ignorant ones. He is rebuking them for their sins and wrongdoings. He does not accept nor put up with their sin. And then finally in verse 24 through 29, he starts to teach them the right way to live. And he starts it off when he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, he sets God up as the creator of everything, as the one true God. He starts to teach them the right way to think, the right way to believe, the right way to act. And so the three things I believe that he sets up, the three guidelines is to first love and then rebuke and then teach. And all three of these areas, because he's talking to all three different people groups. In other words, to witness to these different kinds of people and combat their ignorance in biblical matters, you first love, then rebuke, and then teach. I believe it's laid out like this in Acts chapter 17 on purpose. Because see, so many people try to skip steps. So many people try to rebuke before they love. They skip straight to the rebuking. And they don't try to form a relationship. They don't try to love. And that's what runs people away from the church. When we go straight to rebuking. Rebuking definitely has its place. Uh, we see Jesus and the apostles rebuke people's sins many times. But if that is always the first place that we go, then we're doing something wrong. On the other side of that, some people, they want to form a relationship, but they never want to tell somebody when they're doing wrong. They never want to call uh, sin, sin. They never want to tell people that they're, they're dishonoring God. And if you never tell people that what they're doing is wrong, their lives are going to be displeasing to God. We're going to apply this method of love, rebuke, and teach to these different kinds of people groups. And while the method is the same for all three, the application does look different. So let's get into it. The first one we're going to look at is our non-believers. We're going to combat ignorance and non-believers. And when it comes to non-believers who are ignorant in who God is, like I said, all too often we find hard-nosed Christians like holding signs and protesting you know, repent or you're going to hell. What you're doing is sin. All these, all these kind of rebukings, but they never try to form this relationship. They're quick to call out the sins of non-believers without ever first loving. 
And this puts a wall between the, the, the non-believers and the church. And it also puts a wall between the non-believers and God. Like I said, we run people off when we go straight to rebuking. Many non-believers today have a false idea about what the church is and who God is because of malpractice in witnessing. People who have tried to witness, but they skip steps. They, they went straight to rebuking or they, they went straight to trying to teach them without them first knowing that what they're doing is even wrong or without knowing who you are. I've seen too many movies and TV shows that have Christians acting radical and crazy. It's become a joke in today's society because of this malpractice. It be, it's become a joke because of their ignorance, because of non-believers' ignorance, and honestly, the ignorance on, on the part of some Christians. But our job is to try to change that. Our job is to show the world, to present Christ to the world in a way that scripture tells us to. In a way set out by scripture, and I believe this is the way that this, this passage here lays out witnessing. <clears throat> it starts by first showing love and forming a relationship. I want you to think about the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, right? And the wee little man was he. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a sinner. He was a liar. He was a thief. He was outcast by the religious community. And when Jesus saw him in that tree, what was the first thing Jesus said to him? What did Jesus say? Did Jesus walk up, look up in that tree and say, repent sinner, you're going to hell. No, he didn't say that. Did he look up in that tree and then like, whoa, talk to his disciples and look at his disciples and say, look, we got to kind of go around that tree. We don't want to be seen associating with him. We don't want to be around that. He's a sinner. You know, we're not, we're going to go this way. No, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus went up to him and he said, hey, Zacchaeus, come down for going to your house today. He said, we're gonna go eat. I'm gonna go sit at your table. I'm gonna let people see me with you. Jesus was forming a relationship with him before he started rebuking Zacchaeus' sin. Jesus sets this up as well. Jesus sets up this relationship forming way of witnessing before he starts rebuking. And that's what we need to be trying to do. I myself, I had a friend at USM uh, when I was going to college there. We were in the teaching program together. Uh, it was a girl and uh, she was very uh, outspoken homosexual. And so we, we had all the same classes. We were the same age. We took all the same classes together and we kind of befriended one another. We always parked in the same spot and walked into class together and we just kind of started forming a relationship. And I was very open about my beliefs and everything, except I never brought up the homosexuality thing. I never brought up that, you know, part of it because when I did, that would be rebuking. And so over, over the course of a, a, probably a semester and a half of us going to class together and forming this relationship, we were sitting in a study group one day and uh, she, she just randomly, it was very random, it was not provoked whatsoever. She asked me, she said, hey Kyle, what do you believe uh, the Bible says about homosexuality? Because I had found out before, and I meant to mention this, she was raised in the church. I don't remember what denomination, it might've been Baptist, it might not have, but she was raised in the church and whenever she came out as gay, they kicked her out of the church. They said, we can't have you here. And so she was hurting from that. And she asked me, what do you believe the Bible says about homosexuality? And so I was, you know, very upfront with her. I was very honest with her. What I believe the Bible says about homosexuality. And you know what she did? She said, thank you. She did not bite at me. She didn't try to berate me. She didn't try to prove me wrong. She said, thank you. I appreciate that. You know why? Because I had formed that relationship. I had established my credibility before I started rebuking. And because I did that, I was able to rebuke in a way that didn't come off as judgmental, that didn't come off as me putting her down, but I was very open and honest about what I believe scripture says. Now, she also told me that she disagrees. And you know how our relationship ended? The, one of the last times I ever saw her, it didn't necessarily end, but we parted ways. 
She invited me to her wedding. No, I didn't go. But still, that showed me that I still had that credibility in her life. Now understand that you can't form a real close relationship to every non-believer that you cross paths with. But you can have a positive impact on someone in a very short amount of time if you are positive. If you are at least a little outgoing, not crawled up in your shell, not, not so shy that you can't speak. And let me tell you something, the best way to make a positive, a quick positive impact is to ask small non-intrusive questions. To just ask them things about themselves. For example, uh, we took the students uh, to play volleyball on Tuesday. A lot of y'all were there. And uh, there were, while we were playing, there was a, uh, some kids who came and they started playing volleyball on a court real close to ours. And, and so we were all like, hey, y'all wanna come play with us? Because there was only, there was four of them and they couldn't really have a game themselves. And so we were like, hey, come play with us. And so they came in. Y'all remember their names, any of you? I was just curious. I wrote it down. I would have forgot, but I wrote it down. It was Jeb, Gus, Penelope, and Evie. Now they're from Alaska, so I don't think they're on the live stream. If you are, hey. Um, <laughs> they were from Alaska. They were down for their great aunt's 85th birthday. Their aunt and uncle from California came out and played along with us, and their cousin from Pennsylvania came and played. The birthday party was in New Orleans. And they were touring the Gulf Coast and happened upon some volleyball nets. And we only played with them for about an hour. And we were playing volleyball the whole time, but we got to learn all that information because we were asking small, non-intrusive questions. We got to know them and we formed a relationship with them because we asked these questions. They were all very nice. We got the opportunity to talk with them and we got to know who they were because we asked questions like, what's your name? Where are you from? What brings you here? Things like that. When you have the opportunity to be around someone real often, like at work or whatever, you, you form that positive relationship. Build your credibility with that person before you start rebuking. But if you don't, if you only have a short time with them, don't underestimate the power of being just a little bit nosy. Find out questions, ask questions about them, find out things about them. Either way, once you've built that relationship and established your credibility with the person, it's time to call a spade a spade, as they say. There has to come a point where we do tell them that sin is sin. This is the rebuking part. Now, we don't have to be mean. We don't have to be rude about it. But we cannot allow them to continue living in their ignorance. We have got to combat the ignorance in non-believers. And we do that by first loving. But we have to get to the rebuking part where we tell them you're living in sin. With my friend from college, I got to be very frank with her because I got to build that relationship and establish my credibility, but we can't stop there. We have to call out sin like Paul did when he called out the Athenians for ignorant idol worship. So we first love, then we rebuke sin, and finally we start teaching them the right way to live like Paul did here starting in verse 24. We tell them that they don't have to live in sin any longer. We get to teach them who God is. We get to teach them that they have a God who loves them, who died for them and wants to save them from a, a, an eternity of death. We get to tell them that God wants to take away their sin and their shame and their guilt and their pain and their hurt, their anxiety, their depression. God wants to take all that from them. And we get to teach them that. And that's how you plant seeds in non-believers. It's similar in false believers, but there's something you have to be cautious of. So the second part is false believers, how to love, rebuke, and teach. Now, false believers, these are people that are religious, right? Quote, unquote, religious, but they preach a message that's not aligned with what God's word says. They are ignorant in the truth of the gospel. Like I said before, the method of love, rebuke, and teach still applies here. But you have to be cautious when you're talking to, not, uh, to false believers because as you're trying to witness to them, they're trying to witness to you as well. When you're speaking to someone that has views that don't align with, align with scripture, you have to be pretty solid in your own beliefs 
or you're going to start getting confused. You're, they might start turning you because they can make some pretty convincing arguments for false beliefs. I'm going to talk about just a couple of those real quick. There's a belief that exists here in Picayune that you have to speak in tongues in order to prove your salvation. That is a real belief here in our city. Now, some of you may think that's, that's crazy. We're talking, we're, we just finished a message uh, on Wednesday nights called uh, Gifts for the Call. We've been talking about spiritual gifts. And when we talked about tongues, we talked about how uh, spiritual gifts are not proofs of salvation because the Holy Spirit, Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to who he deems needs them. So the Holy Spirit gives them out at his will. Therefore, he may not give me and you the same spiritual gift. And he may not give you a certain spiritual gift at a certain time in your life. Therefore, you cannot use spiritual gifts as a proof of salvation. We talked about what you can use as a proof of salvation, and that's the fruits of the Spirit. Because the fruits of the Spirit are what the Spirit puts out in somebody's life. And the Spirit's not going to put out that fruit if the Spirit does not exist in your life. Therefore, being a proof of salvation. And so that is a false belief that some people believe even here in Picayune. Another one that I've heard is that homosexuality is okay because Jesus never spoke out against it. Now that may or may not be true. I haven't done a whole lot of research into that. But I do, I do know that all of scripture is God breathed and that it talks a lot about it in, in the epistles and even in the Old Testament. And so just because it's not present in four of the books, it is present in many, many others. So another false belief. Another one is that you have to pick up snakes in order to prove your salvation. I don't, I don't know of any churches around here, but I do know they exist. I've seen documentaries on those churches. And uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about this one. I, was, I had an example of what I was talking about. I, I, I brought in a snake this morning, but I, it got away from me somewhere in here. So if you happen to see it, let me know and I'll, I'll collect it. Another false belief is that this is real. This is from a church in California that put this out. You can lay on the grave of dead Christians and soak in their blessings. It's called grave soaking. There are many false beliefs out there. So when you approach someone that has a false belief about scripture, you have to be solid enough in your own knowledge of scripture, in your own faith, as to not be led astray. And you may ask, well, what if someone says something that you're not sure is true? Maybe it sounds a little weird, a little wonky, but I guess it could be true. I just don't know that much about it. Should I just put it off as being a false belief? No. If you're not sure, then seek it out for yourself. Be mature enough in your own faith to go to scripture and find out for yourself and ask someone that you trust. Brother Bruce is one of the most knowledgeable guys I've ever met about scripture. He'll probably know. You can ask him. Finding out and seeking it out for yourself is extremely important. Being mature enough to do that is even more important. So we should still be loving and forming some kind of relationship, even with false believers. But at the same time, we have to be solid enough in our own faith to not be led astray. We shouldn't outcast them. We shouldn't belittle them for believing something different because they may be just as lost as somebody who doesn't believe in God at all. Again, once you've built that trust, you can start to tell them where their beliefs are inaccurate. You can tell them what you believe scripture says about a certain topic, rebuking false doctrine and teaching at the same time. Now with both non-believers and false believers, with both of them, it's important to remember that we are not called to be around them constantly. We are not called to be with non-believers and false believers every second of every day of our life. Because it's human nature to take on attributes of people that you hang out with all the time. Whenever you're around somebody very, you know, every day, you, it's, it's our nature to soak up things from them, things about them that we take on. For example, the more time I spend with my wife, the prettier I get. 
She told me not to embarrass her, so I had to throw something in. Things that people say, things that people do. I have a friend that uses a word that does not exist. Anybody ever heard of the word kindly? And some of you are thinking, that, that's a real word. Some of you are thinking, well, I mean, she, you know, you look very nice today, she said kindly. That's not what he says. It's a mixture of kind and of. So for example, if he says, uh, you know, touches the stove, that stove's kindly hot. It's not a real word, but all of us that hang out with him all the time have now adopted it into our vocabulary and find ourselves, we get picked on a lot from other people, you know, other parts of our friend group that find us saying that only because we've soaked that in. We've soaked in that word. It's now part of our vocabulary. We're like sponges and sometimes we pick up things that our friends do or say or even believe. So when it comes to non-believers and false believers, we should be forming a meaningful relationship with them, but not surrounding ourselves with them every moment of every day. We need to be surrounding ourselves with good Christian influences as to not accidentally slip into the way of the non-believers and the false believers. But this next one, the last one here is different. The last one is different from these two in that aspect of not being with them all the time. The last one is baby believers. Baby believers, newly saved individuals are people who have been saved for a long time and have never grown in their faith. They aren't ignorant as to who God is, but they are in the way uh, in how to walk with God and how to, in how to build that relationship with him. These are people that need a mature Christian around them to help them grow. They need somebody around them all the time who's going to be an accountability partner for them, who's going to be there with them through their walk with Christ. Maybe you're not moving in with them, but you're with them every day. You stay in contact with them. You help them. You talk to them. You pray for them. You are there for them every single day. Baby believers need to be mentored in their walk with Christ because they have not built a solid doctrinal foundation in Scripture and they can be easily led astray. When I first got saved, I was playing football and I was attending youth group at Mill Creek. I was playing football for Poplarville, going to church in Picayune, and I was surrounded by positive influences every time I went to youth group. And when I was in football... Throughout the day, every day, well, you've heard of locker room talk. I was not surrounded by positive influences. And so I ended up finding myself living two different lives. One at church where I was the good Christian boy and one at football where I wasn't. I was trying to, you know, be friends with all these people who were bad influences. So I was acting like them and behaving like them. And finally, when I learned that we are supposed to behave the same way at church that we do in our lives, I started trying to do that. I was a baby Christian. I didn't know exactly how to do that, but I started trying. And I remember one time when I was, when I was a very young Christian, I had just recently been saved and I, had, I was carrying my Bible around with me everywhere I went. I would, I would randomly open it. I would read a verse throughout the day at school and everything. And I always kept, carried that so everybody knew that I was a Christian, like, don't cuss in front of me, you know, <laughs> kind of deal, the baby Christian. And so one day we're in the locker room and uh, to a buddy of mine and another guy on the team, they started, you know, getting buck with each other. They, they got up in each other's face. They was yelling at each other and it was about to come to blows. You could just tell it, the fist came up and they were about to start swinging. And you know what I did? This isn't my Bible. But I grabbed my Bible and I walked right between them. And I said, Ephesians 4.30 says, let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from all of you. And it got so awkward in that room <laughs> that they forgot they were mad at each other. <laughs> Bad thing was, both of them just got mad at me. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was a baby Christian and I, and I needed guidance. I started learning how to actually handle situations like that. I learned how to walk and, you know, be with, how to do my walk with Christ. The word's not coming to me. Baby believers need mature Christians around them to love on them, rebuke their wrongdoings when they mess up and teach them the correct way to walk with Christ. When I was a baby believer, I needed a lot of rebuking. I did things that I shouldn't have 
and, and I, you know, I feel bad about those today, but Christ has forgiven me. I've asked for forgiveness for those things. But those who helped me the most when I was a baby Christian were those who made it a priority to simply hang out with me, to simply be there with me, to do things with me, to go play volleyball with me. That's what helped me the most was them being present in my life. We need mature Christians who are willing to take the time to mentor young Christians. And y'all, that's, that's not just talking about young people. That's young Christians. But maybe you fall into the category of a young believer. Whether it be that you're recently saved or maybe you haven't pursued your walk with Christ as much as you should have, either way, I encourage you to find a more mature Christian to walk with you and try to be around them as much as you can to learn how to do the things that we're supposed to do. And y'all, I'm gonna close with this. In verse 30, the last, the last two verses I'm gonna read, 30 and 31, this is how Paul wraps up his message to the Athenians. Verse 30, he says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands you, I'm sorry, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has uh, set a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Y'all, there comes a time in our lives that God expects us to overcome and to overlook, as it says, our ignorance. There comes a time where we have to move past it. Now, I've been talking in the, in the uh, point of view where we are the mature Christian and we're talking to these people, but maybe that's not you. Maybe that's not you yet. Maybe you fall into the category of one of these people we've been talking about. Maybe, maybe you're still a non-believer. Maybe you've never accepted Christ into your life and you are still ignorant to who God is. Maybe God's calling you this morning to step out of that ignorance and into salvation. Maybe, maybe you have some false beliefs. Maybe some of the ones that I talked about rung with you, resonated with you. Maybe you're just not confident in some of the things that you've been told to believe and you need to dive deeper into his word. And maybe you're a baby believer. Maybe you need help figuring out how God wants you to live life. Maybe God's calling you to a closer walk with him. We're gonna, we're gonna turn it back over to our music and we're gonna have an invitation and I wanna invite you, anybody who needs prayer, to either come to the altar to pray or come pray with me. I would love to pray with you. Anybody who needs salvation this morning, come up here and let me pray with you. Don't wait, because we're not promised tomorrow. Don't wait on salvation. Anyone who wants to follow up in their salvation with baptism, come forward and we will present you to the church. That is the first step in obedience. That is the first thing that you do, baby Christians, to walk with Christ. And then finally, anybody who wants to join the church, Come chat with me. Thank you, Brother Kyle, for that message today, and thank you for your presence here in this place. Let me remind you that uh, 
uh, there are some meetings, personnel committee right after the benediction, and also this afternoon, four o'clock, the nominating committee uh, meets today. Remember to take your bulletin with you and look for all of those opportunities that we have through the week for you to gather, for you to do, to be a part of uh, the ministry of Union Baptist Church. Remember to pray for your church. Remember to pray for your staff, and especially our, our pastor as he's away. He'll be back next Sunday as we gather for uh, for a great time of fellowship uh, as we celebrate the fourth together. Um, yes, sir. Correct. All right. Um, let's see. Clovis Crocker, would you come and um, close us in prayer today? <laughs> Father, Lord, we just praise your holy name, Lord. We just thank you for your word and the message that you brought to our hearts today. Oh, Father, I just pray that you will open the eyes of each one of our understanding on, on what your will is for our life, Lord, as, as we present ourselves to you to be uh, instruments of your peace, Father, Lord. We, we want to serve you. We love you. And we just thank you for, for all you have done for us, Lord, and, and we give ourselves to you. And God, as we leave this place, I pray that you will uh, set your angels around us and protect us and that we will come back to this house of worship again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.